Okay, everyone, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce you to Linda Espy, but I'm actually just going to start the introduction now with reading out um, one of the comments that we received in preparation for tonight. Unfortunately, um, the founder of SIMA, Dr. Robin Robinson, wasn't available to be here tonight. She has had health issues, but she's written a lovely message to start us off tonight. She said, Dear Linda, congratulations on your book, Pondering Grief. It is an outstanding contribution based on many years as a counsellor, consultant and educator in the area of life with which you bring your insights and many talents and artistry. It will enlighten and comfort both those who are grieving and those who seek to support them in their journey. I'm sorry I cannot be with you there tonight. And that's a message from Dr. Robin mm. Robinson. And that really encapsulates a lot of what SIM is about, that we're here to support people who might be going through difficult times and we're also there to support each other. On that note, I'm going to just um, welcome Linda. Thank you. And did you want to say a couple of words first, Linda, before I start asking you questions? Yeah, well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here, um, Alexina, and thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to spending time with everyone tonight and thank you for coming along and showing your interest. And certainly our aim is to, you know, start off, I guess, by having a bit of a conversation together and then certainly opening it up um, to include your thoughts and reflections around loss, grief, change and transition. So thank you for coming out this evening. And behind us, you'll notice um, two photos. And I um, just want to point out that the one on the left is actually in the book. Linda, do you want to tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, that's um, a little girl that I um, noticed when I was overseas with my daughter about two or three years ago um, in a sort of back street of Nice. I was just walking along casually with my daughter on holiday obviously with my camera. I just looked to the left, there was a bit of space around her, so she stood out. And as soon as I saw her as a witness, obviously I'm not in her body and I, I don't really know about her experience, but it's about looking at her and what was evoked in me. And it was something about, you know, sadness, disappointment. I sense as a mother myself that she was having a little tanty um, but she was pretty unhappy with the way things were going. And so I just thought, oh, I just felt really drawn to snap that with my camera because I related to it um, as a grieving little girl, as a grieving adult and, and as a mum. Yeah. And we're going to come to the next picture a little bit later, but I think that really encapsulates one of Linda's main roles as a photographer. And I'm just going to actually read out a review of her recent book by Karen Bedford, who's the managing editor of St Luke's Innovative Resources, which many of you will know from previous um, contact with some of the resources there, where Karen actually says, ponder is such a beautiful word, round, deep and slow quiet and meandering, full-hearted and spacious. No wonder this word features in the title of Linda Espy's new book, Pondering Grief, a collection of words and images about change and transition. Readers will find qualities of the word ponder abundantly present on every page, as are the different nuances, hues and faces of grief. Linda's a Melbourne-based counsellor, psychotherapist, educator, photographer, art therapist and author and a previous staff member of SIMA, so a previous executive staff member of SIMA, mm. so very valuable um, asset to our organisation. So let's actually take that word, ponder, and um, a couple of us were present at Linda's book launch a few weeks ago, and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. one of the people speaking at her book launch, Jill, talked about language and the importance of language, and she picked up the word ponder too. That, um, she looked up the meaning of pondering, it means to weigh. And that's often what we do, isn't it, when we're actually going through change and transition, is we're weighing. So what made you come up with that word? Look, it, it wasn't difficult. I, I, I didn't go searching for a title. It was just there. And it's something I do um, as a photographer and as a counsellor, you know, a part mm. of the process of counselling and psychotherapy is to sit together and, and ponder and wonder and explore 
It speaks to me of curiosity. It was an edited version. I'd actually originally had the working title, The Art of Pondering Grief. And one of my friends, um, Anna Bardsley, who's a writer, and I met Anna through the grief field. She was very involved in the early days, going back 25, 30 years ago with compassionate friends. And Anna said to me, what about just pondering grief? You know, so the book certainly has a lot of space around it and that enables space to ponder. And I was a bit wedded to the notion of art because I thought I was being a little bit arty-farty and I thought that, you know, I wanted the art uh, in the book to somehow stand out. So a little bit perhaps egocentric. But I took on Anna's advice immediately and... Um, I also thought I didn't want people to misinterpret some notion that there was an art of pondering grief as if, you know, it was easy to navigate and negotiate, which it's so not. You know, grief is chaos. So in retrospect, I really value Anna's um, wisdom in actually just leaving out the notion of the art of as if grieving could be taught as opposed to the way that we just experience it. Yeah. And that probably brings me to one of the main questions that I had hearing you at your book launch is how did you get started in the book? How did the book come about for you? Oh, well, um, my husband Al and I were driving to um, Reiki in December last year. Um, it was mid-December, so coming up for Christmas. I was driving and Al was the, the passenger. And we were talking about my brother Larry, who um, at 64 was coming towards the end of his life after um, a year of um, fairly you know, aggressive cancer. And he was very much with us sort of every day as we were trying to look at and witness and come to terms if you can at all you know with his sort of illness and um pending death and al said to me you know why don't you write another book i'd always wanted to but there hadn't been the space or or a trigger so i said to al um in my imitable style you know get get out a piece of paper from my bag and a pen and I just started to reel off the words. And um, that was the beginning of the words that, that, you know, are within the book. And so it was, it came from, you know, my brother's illness and pending death. And in fact, I've dedicated the book to him because he died some months after. Mm. Thanks for sharing that with mm. us, Linda. And um, I understand that it was a real family effort, the book. It was because um, my husband, Al, is a, a mosaic artist. So um, I had taken photos of some of his work previously. Um, being interested in photographer and not as a professional photographer, but just a passionate photographer of um, all things ordinary. But I think that you can capture with photography something quite extraordinary stuff that we often walk by and don't notice or pay attention to is what I'm drawn to. So obviously it has some of my photography in it and it's got some, um, a couple of works that my sister did and it's got a photo that my stepsister Tracy took on the page that reflects family. Um, Trace took when we were in New York last year and her daughter also did a, um, a painting, a watercolour that I discovered um, a number of years back and I said to Megs when I saw it, oh, can I have a photo of your uh, painting? And I've used that photo in lectures on self-care for a few years. So, yeah, it is a bit of a You a can hear it's a bit of a family effort. There, yeah, you, so. and a, a mm. piece of pottery that my mum mm. had done mm. um, some mm. years back. So... Mm. Yes. They were images that I think <laughs> fitted, not that I set out to, mm, yes. to be that inclusive, but I'm glad that, that they're there. So, Linda, one of the things <laughs> I heard you say at the book launch was that um, it was a labour of love. Can you tell mm. us a little bit about that? 
Oh. Um, the book was. Hmm. Um, I find to balance my work as a counsellor and educator and clinical supervisor, the need to have a creative project on the go, sort of annually. <coughs> Mm. And so this was this year's project. And um, even though I'm proud of it and just on the beginning of the journey in sort of um, spreading the word, so to speak, so that this is a book that sits in community and that people ponder and use, you know, we can talk about this stuff despite it's, um, it being painful and at times difficult and sometimes where there's no words. So I've got, a, 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 I think, a big job ahead of me over the next few years as I've done in all of my career to be able to stand up and talk about loss and grief and, and reflect on it and support people around it. Um, there's a loss in it being over or the, the creative part being over. Now it's sort of, in a sense, you know, back to work to sort of... Um, support people to use it mm. and, and gain from it in the way that, it, you know, that I'd sort of designed it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I'm in a new phase of, of that creative sort of mm. journey, I guess. Linda asked me, would I, she told me about this creative project and I've known or, uh, for many years, I've known Linda and she always does have to have a creative project on the, on the go. And, uh, so Linda sent me um, a couple of versions and then she said, look, Nicole, can you just have a look at this one and just give me a sense of what you think? I remember I was just fresh to, to coming out of Sudan. And as I was going through um, what Linda had put together, the impact that it had on me was something that was very grounding and um, it was quite a gift for myself just to take each page and to, to look at it. And at that point it wasn't even in the version that it is now. Um, but I loved the expansiveness of it, the words, um, the, the little captions. And in me, that feeling of being deeply rooted in something that was very significant um, took hold of me. And um, a kind of like um, an at-homeness with something that I knew something about, because we all know something about grief. And so there was a resonance there, insightful, thought-provoking, and I think the most important word for me at that point was silence because each page I had a connectedness to in some way and it was that quality of silence and I've come to appreciate silence in my own life um, a lot more and it is certainly something that is very much part of grief, part of trauma and um, it's something that's deeply respectful and sacred and unique. So I, I sent those words to Linda and I said, Linda, this is just at a first glance. I'm very happy to look at it further when I've got my head and my heart back here a lot more. And Linda just put an email back and she said, Nicole, I think that's it. So there you go. There is a lot out there about grief and, and I've been working in the field for 35 years and I've seen a lot of change and transition in the field of practice. <coughs> you know, even from my early work in perinatal death and miscarriage where you know, babies that had died, you know, weren't given to the parents to see or hold. And the work that I did in those early days um, with a small group of others in Sands sort of brought changes in um, hospital practices and funeral practices even around that. So having said that, yes, there's been a lot of change in 35 years I've witnessed and that I've been 
you know, I'm privileged to say a part of, you know, that sort of chipping away and making a difference. But I guess in 2018, there hasn't been this book. There hasn't been this installation, this compilation of words and images and reflective questions that have come together. So I think there's a place for it because grief is so unique and so individual, this will touch those who read it in its own way and in its own time. So I guess because there's so much grief and so many people that know their experience of it, for me, this is something that might complement some people who haven't accessed it in this way before. And this actually leads me to point out there's some flyers at the back as well as um, books there available. Um, but there's actually, um, uh, Linda's actually um, looking to start some pondering circles. So mm. would you like to tell us a little bit about the pondering circles? Yeah, well, in? that's um, something, you know, by way of reflective practice and support that I've wanted to do um, alongside this book as someone who's run groups and different groups mostly bereavement groups for many, many years um, in different sort of, you know, formulations. I thought um, to offer some opportunities for individuals to gather, you know, 10 or 12 or 15 colleagues or friends, whether it be in the workplace or in church or book clubs or community groups, to come together for us to sit around with the book and and reflect on grief and change and transition um, with an aim to, you know, support people to navigate the issues and the words and, and the impact, support, edu psychoeducation, a space just to come and sort of chew it over. Yeah. I haven't looked at the book yet and I'm desperate to now. Um, but could you talk about the relationship between the images and the words and how you see the role of the images in the context of the work? Yes, thank you. That's, um, that's a great question. One of the sort of um, premises that was very much um, on my mind as a therapist and as a photographer and as an art therapist was that um, when I delivered the words that Al took down, I just then pondered, you know, the body of photography that I have, which is about 10 years worth, and a few drawings that I'd done. Um, I'm so not an artist, but as an art therapist, I, I had you know, a sm very, very small collection of drawings. So I've, I've looked at the word and then I've often had the sense of the image that would go with it because I know what photos I've got and what felt like a good fit. The book also has um, some quotes from um, other people, people whom um, have moved me in their writing, like Alain de Botton and Louis Kahn, who was an architect, who I've got a quote in here about, who reflects on art. Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk, contemplative. So I had some of those as favourites. So I, I drew on some of them in relation to the words. And then I um, had my own um, sort of writing and ponderances to offer um, to support reflection. Um, so I bought those just together over those months. But I didn't want a word to overtake an image, to overtake a, a quote or an invitation to reflect. So I was um, sort of fairly adamant that I wanted space around all of that so that no one modality privileged over the other. 
And so individuals might be drawn to a word or they might sidle away from it because it's a bit ouchy or they're not ready for it. And similarly with the images, it, it will touch them or not mm. on any one day or, or viewing. So, yeah. Would you have anything to say about when grief is too much? I would question whether it ever can be because it is what it is, because it is, which is something that I say here. Your too much and my too much is different and what does it mean anyway? Mm -hmm. I think most people survive it and part of the challenge is to learn to live with it. So I don't think about it myself as too muchness. Um, that's not to say that it can't be um, gut-wrenching and overwhelming at times. And that's what it is. As a nurse, I'm sure there's lots of nurses in the room. I know you have those moments where you know, you're dealing with a patient and they've just been told the absolute worst. I think I'm kind of looking for some advice on, I don't even know what to say half the time. Um, yeah, I'd hope... Where do you start? I don't even know where to start sometimes. A patient's just been told the absolute worst. Mm. You can't find a positive at all. Mm. Where do you go? Mm. What do you do? Mm. That's um, a question that's come up for me as an educator over many, many years. What do you say? And if we, you know, concur on the fact that grief is unique and individual, and no two people grieve the same, then there isn't any word or sentence or response mm -hmm. that's gonna hit the spot for all people all of the time. So I think sometimes as healthcare professionals, as you're sort of intimating, I think, we grapple and we look for what to say. Um, most often, if I was to unpack that, and I have done, for many years with nurses, often, um, what do you want to say? And they'll often say to me, well, we don't want to say anything that's going to make it worse. And to that I would say, you can't make it worse. I.e., the baby's died. And if you want to make it better, then bring the baby back alive, because that's what the parents are going to want. So if we actually get that we can't do that, we can't make it better, we can't take the pain away, then the challenge, I think, for those of us witnessing that, the despair or the pain or the shock or whatever, there's nothing prescriptive. So I often invite people to, I think our growing edge or what's needed is for us to um, come to terms with, if, if at all we can, not being able to say or do anything to make it better. So it's about learning to live with the discomfort and know that in living with the discomfort, like that's the source of compassion. Compassion means to suffer with. It's not about taking away. And the other thing I'd say to that is that often we underestimate our own sense of presence. That to be and not do or say is what bereaved people have told me over the years is more comforting. The doctor or the midwife that sits on the bed and that sheds a tear, not because they're unprofessional, but because they're feeling with. And I think there's a lot to be said with us as professionals learning to live with the not knowing, the not knowable, and that sheer sort of helplessness and hopelessness that comes because then you're getting close to their experience. Does that make sense? Mm. We all know that uh, we have different stage in grief. So is there any difference in the way we ponder grief in our different stage? Mm. Again, that's a lovely and a really valid question. 
I'm not sure that I know the answer. Again, it's a bit like I said before about it being unique and individual. So each person will ponder grief in a way that's fitting for where they're at at any point in their grief trajectory. You might be referring um, to the notion of stages of grief that were developed um, in the sort of mid-60s by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who talked about stages. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did some magical work um, in her career as, as a grief um, sort of guru, really. But in fact, um, what she developed in the 60s um, were not stages of grief. They were stages of receiving catastrophic news. So stages of receiving bad news. And because there wasn't a lot around in those years, her stages of receiving bad news were mutated to stages of grief. And in those years, um, we were working on a very medical model where there was like diagno or diagnosis, prognosis, and, and it was talked about as a linear experience, the notion that you start with shock and then you go into denial and then you move towards acceptance and adaptation. But what we know from the lived experience and from the literature since Kubler-Ross is grief is not linear. It's not linear. You know, my colleague Mel McKissick from Sydney talks about grief as chaos. It's all over the shop. So we don't start in stage one and then get to stage five and then live happily ever after. So even though um, Kubler-Ross did some really rich work, there is no stages of grief. Grief is an experience. Um, it's dynamic. It's the proverbial, you know, two steps forward, four back, up, down. Yeah, so that's what I would say in, in that sense. Mm. Yeah. When you mentioned about the title, you know, when you, how you said uh, that when you talked to your friend and the art, you know, you took that word off and you said because it can't be taught. So true because as you said, you know, it's, it is unique and personal for everyone. Um, but I also thought, like, it's also something that you can't master. Like, you know, when you think of a skill or an art, you think, you know, um, oh, I've got to master it. But, you know, we, it's an ongoing, continuous process, isn't it? So, Absolutely. So, um, you know, if, had you titled it that way, like, you know, and people could, like, you know, I, I suppose think, oh, I, I haven't, you know, Here's mastered the, the skill. Like, yeah, mm. like, I'm, you come, sh come off feeling like you haven't quite got there but I guess yeah it's an ongoing conti continual process so you know I really thank you for um, commenting you on that book and I think you bring a lot of uh, your unique experiences and just from your work and your uh, skills um, as art therapist and I'm really looking forward to um, having a, yeah yeah having thank you thank yeah you, thanks for your reflections and I think that your example with your sister is testimony to what um, <coughs> she's given you that response, you know, thank you for being here, it was amazing, and, and you're there saying I was present but I didn't necessarily do anything. Yeah, but just sitting with the discomfort. Yeah, and I think when we're called to do or say, it's an urge that we have mm. to make a difference. Yeah. It's not necessarily needed yeah. by the person grieving. Yeah. And again, sometimes we <coughs> underestimate Under the power of yes. presence. Mm and and not doing or saying but being yeah, yeah. thank you mm. this book is um for those at a time where they can you know dip in and out of it and and um see reflections or not um yeah, so the space around it and the process of reflection, meditation, contemplation, prayer, art, journaling is something that can accompany mm -hmm. us um, as we, you know, learn to live with grief, experience it. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
I think there's something for me that stands out as I reflect on the book and the process, and it's a, maybe a parallel process, and that's about the power of reflection and how it can move you in your experiencing. And I had that throughout the book, each page, each photo, each word, each full stop, you know, should there be a comma or a dash. So there's that sort of the buzziness of that, and that sounds pedantic, but I felt, you know, close and wedded to the process because, um, you know, I think I was grieving in the preparation as well because my brother was, you know, sort of deteriorating and terminal and then actively dying and then I was with him, you know, pre-death and post-death and so I think if I think now, even just in this moment, this was a book in motion. It was a book in motion. Um, and I want to, if you wouldn't mind, read the closing note. Love, loss, light, shade, darkness and hope all come in many and varied shapes and forms, as does grief. Respecting grief in all of its unfolding and passion has offered me some deeply valued lessons. Though excruciating at times, as well as breathtaking, heart aching, head pounding and confusing, I'm thankful for what I have gained in strength and conviction from my experiences. Grief has been my teacher. I have been tested and I have expanded as a person. My hope is that you have found some room and space for yourself and your reflections throughout these pages. Such is pondering grief.